All right, we're doing it, Ryan. Welcome to the World Class Dads podcast, brother. Thanks, Brad. Glad to be on. Yeah, man. I uh, was excited that we have the opportunity to connect. I, I love your show. You put out a ton of great Thank content you. for men, a lot of inspiration. You connect with a lot of amazing guests. Just have a really cool movement that you're really creating there at the Order of Men. Um, Thank you. But real quick for the listeners who who don't know about the Order of Man, can you share a little bit about your background, what led you starting the podcast? Yeah, I mean, pretty uneventful background as far as starting the podcast. I, I, I really thought it would be a great opportunity for me to have incredible conversations with men I was inspired by and motivated by, and I wanted to get some individual coaching from. But I, I thought, what, what, what? would make them want to have a conversation with me? What value would I be mm -hmm. able to add to their lives? Uh, and I had another podcast. It was dedicated towards uh, financial planning, which is what I was doing in a, in a previous life. And I decided to pivot and start this podcast with the goal of talking with great men who are successful on different fronts of life and then distilling what they had to share into information that I could use and that other men could listen to. So initially it was... You know, me and a few other guys might be listening, but almost immediately it blew up, uh, which is a testament to the fact that men want great information. They're willing to, to tune in. They, they want access to it and they want to do something with it. And so mm -hmm. it's turned into over the past six years, this global movement to give men the tools and resources, conversations, accountability, et cetera, that they need to step up as fathers and husbands, leaders in their community business owners, just every facet of life. So it's been an incredible ride over the past six years. We just celebrated our six year anniversary. And like you said, we've had incredible guests on. I think the last time I looked, I want to say we have roughly 330 men that we've interviewed at this point. And I nice. think we have over 750 total podcasts done. So it's been a wild ride, but it's very fulfilling. And um, I get messages every day from men who are impacted by what we do positively. And it's the fuel I need to continue. Yeah, no, those, those messages are definitely fuel. How long do you think it was? You said it was pretty quickly. It blew up. How long from yeah. when you posted that first episode till you realized, oh shit, we're onto something here. I hit a nerve that uh, men, men want this info. Well, I almost, uh, I, I knew that almost immediately because the, and I can't remember the exact number of downloads we had on that first episode, but I, I think, I think it was more in the first couple of days as far as downloads go than my entire downloads in the podcast previously. <laughs> and, and we did like 20, 25 episodes or so. And in the first couple of days, it was more than all of those combined. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I knew, I knew immediately and we were fortunate enough to have some incredible guests early on to the podcast, which helped of course, boost and promote the visibility of what we were doing. But uh, yeah, I, I knew immediately. And we started to grow our social media accounts and following and people who were banded with us. But it took us about, I want to say it was about seven or eight months until we actually put together a, a product uh, that, that men could be part of that proved to me that not only is this a valuable uh, resource for men, it's something that I could turn into a money-making venture and, mm -hmm. and, and a career. So that took us about seven or eight months. And yeah. I believe if I remember right, uh, I was able to shut down the financial planning practice and do this full time uh, within a period of year, a year and a half or two years, which wow. is very quick, very oh, quick yeah. for it to do what it did. Yeah. Especially starting with the content and, you know, I'm going through this journey now. I think when mm -hmm. we post this, this will be episode 23, but mm -hmm. I had a previous show that I did for four years and it was kind of similar as after as on month two, I'm looking at it and we're doing about, we're doing about half the downloads is of what it took me four years to build up to. Um, right. you know, same deal, having big guests. So I know you've had Tim talk to Tim Kennedy a few times. He graced us with his presence that like cool. people like that have helped, mm -hmm. but there is this, I think there's this gap and you hit it earlier than I did. Mine's my show is a little bit more, a little more niche down just to the fatherhood topic, but there, there was, and still is, and you're, you're doing a big job of filling that, uh, just this desire of men to, you know, get content that's going to really help them become better men and, and really lean into that role as a man. So that's something I wanted to get into you a little bit is what does it mean for you personally to be a good man? 
Well, I think there's a distinction we need to make between being a good man and being good at being a man. Oh. There's a difference in, in my mind. Uh, Jack Donovan talks about this quite a bit. Uh, there's a book called Manhood in the Making by David Gilmour that addresses mm. this topic. Good, good. When we think of good, typically what we're referring to is is morality, right? That's that's a that's a good person. He he's honorable. He does the right thing. He's he's kind to people. Mm-hmm. So it speaks to morality, which is important. I mean, we right. all need to be moral for sure. Uh, but being good at being a man, I think, speaks more to capability, which we don't always equate with kindness or or being friendly and being good. It means that we're capable, that we can take resource. Well, we can procure resources. We can take those resources and then refine them in ways that are productive and helpful for people that we can uh, serve through our strength and through our abilities. And that's, that's what I look at as, as far as being good at being a man. And you have to have both because if you're missing the morality component, and I, I know men who are extremely capable, but they're mm-hmm. mis- missing the morality component. And I know other men who are, are good, what I would say, good people, uh, good humans, but they're missing the capability component and, right. and they're not able to influence as effectively. Uh, they're not able to uh, make any sort of, of income or create any opportunities or protect other people. And so you have to have a healthy dose of both. And that's yeah. what I'm striving to do personally. That's awesome. I'm thinking of it now also in the, in the lens of fatherhood of being a good dad and being good at being a dad. And I'd say that latter yeah. one is kind of the concept of why I started this show of men who, who are incredible fathers, but also incredible contributors to society, achieving massive results. And that balance, the, the, the men who you know, have both sides of that and can span that bridge is the guys like you, frankly, are the ones who I'm interested in talking to. Because when I had my daughter a year and a half ago, that was the thing that quickly started to scare the shit out of me. I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to do both? I mean, I'm families at the top of my priority list, but I still have professional ambitions. I want to make an impact. And so that's why I started the podcast. But from the fatherhood perspective, how do you see that in terms of those two sides of the coin? Uh, When I, if I, if you look at it through that lens, being good at being a father, for example, I look at it and think that's somebody who's more assertive, more intentional, Mm -hmm. and more deliberate about the way that they're performing. So Mm -hmm. you might have a father who, you know, does his work and is is there occasionally, or even most of the time, but he's doing the bare minimum. You know, he's there, he's present, he's doing his work. The kids have food and a roof over their head and that's all fine and wonderful. That's like the baseline. You should be doing those things. Uh, But then if you look at it through the lens of being good at being a father, I think of somebody who is more deliberate, you know, they're, they're, they're hyper engaged in their children's schooling and education. They're hyper, hyper engaged in activities and presenting opportunities or even challenges that their children can face uh, that, that will fortify them, that will strengthen them, that will make them tougher and equip them with some capabilities of their own. Uh, So I I think it's more of an assertive role as opposed Mm -hmm. to, yeah, you know, I'm a dad. And that's kind of a passive thing. No, you're a father. You're an engaged father. You have responsibilities. You have opportunities. There's great fulfillment that comes with being a father, but it, it's certainly in a more assertive role in, in that case. Yeah, I, I think it was in one of your solo episode, your yeah. uh, uh, Friday episodes that you do, and you were talking about mm-hmm. this one specific to fatherhood. And I was listening to it the other week. And you were just talking about the role that men have, especially as, as dads Uh is the most impactful role that, that we can have on the future of the, you know, our lineage, future generations, but really in the world, just being a good at being a dad and being a good dad, both those things can have waves of, of influence for literally generations to come. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like how important that is for, your role as dad and to prioritize that? Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to quantify what your what your impact and influence is making on the world, let alone mm-hmm. your children. Po- positively and negatively, by the way. You know, right. you, you don't you actually don't have a say as to whether or not you're going to be influential. Mm-hmm. Are you just showing up, you're you're influencing people. You're right. influencing your chi- your children. The, the, if you come home from work and you're tired and exhausted and you just pull off your fat ass on the couch and you do nothing and you watch TV or you drink a beer and that's all you do and that's what they see, you're influencing them negatively. Yeah. 
is not helping them, right? Uh, but if on the other hand, you come home and you're energetic and you leave your work at the door and you, you go play catch or you have a little tea party with your daughter or you, whatever, whatever your thing is and whatever their age is, and, and they see you as engaged and present and focused and, and, and they feel important, then that's having an influence on them as well. And that influence will rub off on future generations. It's not by default. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I know a lot of men who have had uh, excellent fathers uh, who have had their own set of challenges, most of it self-imposed. And then I've had other men that uh, don't have had horrible fathers that make something great of themselves. Mm -hmm. So it isn't, it isn't written in stone that you're going to be just like your father. In fact, you are not your father. You know, my, my dad, unfortunately, wasn't around all that much. And I don't think it was because he didn't want to be. He just made some poor choices. And uh, my mother and him ended up splitting up when I was three. Uh, I would have loved to have seen more of him. But, you know, the time that I did see of him, I knew that he had love for me and that he cared about me. I wish he had made different choices. But I feel pretty confident with what I am as a father now, which is mm -hmm. different, I would say, than my father. So I'm, I'm not obligated to follow in his, his footsteps. You know, but but I think the role of a father is a very interesting one, especially well for both your your sons and daughters. You know, your sons are going to look at you as an example of how to interact with the world and what kind of man they want to be, and your daughters are going to look to you and decide consciously and subconsciously what kind of man they want to be with. Mm -hmm. So we have a huge opportunity to influence both our young boys and young girls and in, in how they interact with members of the same sex and opposite sex and how they view their work and how they view life and victimhood and politics and all of these other things that we, you know, religion and spirituality, all these things that we talk about. Yeah, absolutely. So how many kids do you have? We didn't, we didn't, we didn't get into that in the beginning, but yeah. What, uh, and what are their ages? So I've got a 13 year old boy. I've got a 10 year old boy. Uh, I've got a eight, an eight, uh, almost eight year old girl and an almost five year old boy. So I've got four. Awesome. Full house yeah. and spreads the gambit oh, yeah. of ages and you got a little, yeah. little mixed bag there. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It keeps us, uh, keeps us engaged. I can, in fact, I can hear him playing around downstairs right now as we speak. I love that. So you, um, so you, your oldest is 13. So when mm -hmm. you started the podcast six years ago, you already, you already had, I think, I guess three kids then. And, yeah. uh, you had your financial planning practice. What was that Correct. transition like though? Once you, you know, you launched the product for order of man, you prove out mm -hmm. that it, it could be a business. Was that something that was a challenge for you at all from kind of just a, um, just from the standpoint of, I'm not sure if your financial practice was your own, but jumping into something new with your family to provide, provide for. Uh, no, no, it really wasn't that challenging. And I know my circumstance is a lot different than other people, but I had my own financial planning practice okay. to answer your question or your, your comment there earlier. Uh, and so I, the way the financial planning world works for, for, for most of the, the world is, is that you build up residual income. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so over a period of almost 10 years, I believe it's nine years, uh, I had built up a healthy residual income, which allowed me to be at home and it allowed me to set my schedule. And so, you know, I was there and I was present and I was available <clears throat> during my financial planning practice years. So the, and then as I was building order of man, I was doing both. I had the financial planning stuff and then I had order of man. So, uh, I had a kind of a unique situation. And then when I switched over to order of man, unless I ever talked about it, they wouldn't have known because I worked from home and, uh, so everything was very, very similar. I ended up selling my practice. So we had a nest egg set aside. Mm. So it, it was a very fortunate and blessed situation that we were in. That's not to say it was lucky. I mean, we created that right, you know, over right. a lot of years of toil and struggle and stress and crying. And just, it was rough, you know, especially early on. Uh, but no, it wasn't a challenge for us. And in fact, it was, it, it was immediately beneficial because I was significantly more fulfilled and rewarded and energized, which naturally spilled over into how I led my family. Yeah. And the focus of your business then being, being on the, the concept of being a better man, I'm sure positively yeah. impacted the family as, as a whole. Well, it's very, it's very integrated. 
You know, yeah. my, my work and my family life would be hard to differentiate. There, there's no, there's no solid line or wall between the two, like there are for a lot of men. Mm -hmm. And I get it. You know, sometimes that's going to be the situation, but the more integrated that a man can be, the better off he is. He's significantly more efficient and effective. He's not wearing multiple hats. We hear that all the time. I got to put my dad hat on or my, my business hat on. There's, there's no hat, like there's just life, right? Mm -hmm. And if you have to be a different person in a different environment, man, what a shame. Uh, we just had a gentleman by the name of Chad Wright, former Navy SEAL, ultra endurance athlete, uh, come, come here to do a podcast. He came here to Maine. He stayed for a couple of days. He stayed here in our home and we've had nice. a dozen other people stay here. And my children get to see me interact with those men. Like high, I'm talking high caliber, high quality men mm -hmm. that they get to interact with. They're staying here. We're eating dinner and breakfast together. We're having conversations all just in our daily lives, but they see this as an element of my work. But again, it's very integrated. There's right. no delineation between work and play and fatherhood. It's all right here. My kids will probably at some point, not during the podcast, cause they know better, but <laughs> afterwards come in and show me my daughter came in this morning and showed me some dolls that she had made. And my son will come in and talk about his new PR on his push press. And cause it's here, right? It's like, it, it's always, it's here. It's, uh, it's very integrated. I love that. So you talked uh, about how there were some tears and, and, and some uh, oh, challenging yeah, times early on. Did you have to, I mean, prior to the podcast, was there that there was that learning curve, it sounds like to get to that point of integration? What were some of the things you learned early on as you're trying to strike that, that balance or that or create that integration in your life? Yeah. I mean, it was hard because I was trying to grow the financial planning practice <clears throat> and it's a hard business to get into. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in fact, the adage is that, you know, for the first several years, you're, you're significantly underpaid for your work. But after mm -hmm. that, once you hit that, that stage is a turning point. And I certainly experienced it. You're significantly overpaid for what you do, <laughs> uh, but I think that's like anything, you know, yeah. the longer you stick with something and the more efficient and effective you become. But yeah, early on, you know, I struggled and I had to put a lot of hours in and I had to, uh, well, I mean, neglect, frankly, my wife and my uh, two children, I might have had uh, our little girl might have been a newborn. Uh, so I, I neglected a lot of that. And I, and I said that the reason I was is because I had to grow the business. And the hard part is there's an element of truth to that, right? And I know a lot of guys are listening who are thinking, you know, I'd love to be home with my family. I'd love to have a home office. I'd love to be able to do something like you're doing and make a profitable uh, healthy living doing it, but I have to work. And I, and I agree, you know, men have to do what we have to do. And, and there was a stage in my life where, yeah, I had to leave every day and I had to go do it. And I had to work late nights and early mornings. Even when I was starting order of man, uh, I would work two hours in the morning. I would do my, my normal job. Then I would do two hours a night. And so I just wasn't there and present. And there's a time for that. But what I failed to do is communicate effectively. And I let it go too far. I really mm. did. I let it go too far. Uh, my wife was exhausted. I was exhausted. We started bickering with each other. I mean, we actually went through a separation uh, 11, 12 years ago. That was a very painful separation because I let a lot of myself go. Uh, fortunately, I, I started focusing on myself and improving myself, getting my diet, and nutrition, and exercise locked in, getting the finances in order, picking up some new hobbies, finding some new friends. It's interesting because we talk about this and what I'll tell a lot of guys is, look, I know you're busy with work. I know you're busy with family obligations, but you have to carve out time for yourself. Right. It might be a couple of days a week. You go into the gym or you do some, some physical exercise or training, or maybe there's uh, you know, a, a golf league every Wednesday night that you belong to or a bowling league. I don't know what it looks like for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I tell these guys, you have to do that. And they're like, well, I don't even have time to do what I'm doing now. But it's interesting because the more time you take for yourself, the more energy that you have to be able to fully engage with other people, which is kind of counterintuitive because guys feel like they're, you know, up to their eyeballs and tasks and assignments and projects and duties and responsibilities as it is. But man, I, I learned to take care of myself, uh, which gave me the energy I needed to not only manage the business more effectively, but to be present for my wife and kids. Yeah. I'm always fascinated by that phase because it seems that anybody who, any of the men who I talk to, especially who have children you know, before they quote unquote make it, but while they're in those early days 
of trying to build a business or, or really try to accomplish something great at their craft, they have to come to that crossroad of, you know, high demands on their time to be able to really get to that level of achievement that they're trying to get to. But also there's the demands from the family side. And like you said, you have to be able to show up there too. So it doesn't all fall apart. Um, so while you were going through that, I guess, as you came out the other side, other than just investing time into yourself to be a, a you know, stronger, more healthy, more thoughtful partner, a partner for your wife, father to your kids and, and for your business as well. Is there anything else that you learned from that or advice that you'd give to young fathers who are at that stage where they're grinding to, you know, make it to that level of excellence, but also, you know, want to keep, keep the shit together at home. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say a couple of things. Number one, boundaries are very important. Mm. Uh, and, and you need to honor those boundaries and uphold those boundaries because if you don't, then they aren't really boundaries. And so what's the point of having them in the first place? So let me give you an example. Yeah. If you tell your wife and kids that you're going to be home at six o'clock, uh, but you're going to work hard until six o'clock and you're going to be home at six, you better damn well be home at six, mm -hmm. not six fifteen, not six thirty, not eight o'clock, six o'clock. Mm-hmm. When, when you get home, be present and available with them, you know, take this device that's, you know, ringing in your ear and texting you and everything else, like take it and put it away and be present. That's a boundary that you have to create. Uh, but also there's boundaries with work. You know, I told you, my kids don't come in when I'm podcasting. That's a boundary. They don't do it. If they have something they need to say, if it's an emergency or something, they're welcome to do that. And they know that because I've communicated, they might knock on the door. If I don't answer, they know, Hey, well, dad must still be on his podcast. If I do answer, then, you know, of course I'm available. Yeah. But, but these are boundaries that we've established and put in place. And so you have to create those boundaries. And what it does is it gives you the ability to be present because I know if I'm going to go into work from, let's say 8 a.m. to six o'clock in the evening, uh, and then I'm done, like I, I'm done. I, when I get at six o'clock, I'm checking out, I'm going home, phone's going away. I, I, I made sure when I was leaving the office and coming home, uh, when I worked at an office outside of the home that I had uh, quiet in the car and I used that time to decompress so I can be fully present and available for my family. Hmm. Uh, and I started to realize that when I upheld the boundaries I created for myself, uh, I was way more productive and effective with my time at work because I didn't have the luxury of it bleeding over into my personal life because I had established that hard and fast rule right. that it wasn't going to do that. So when I was tempted to get on the phone at work or be distracted or get sucked into a conversation that wasn't productive, it was easy for me to say, Hey, I can't do this right now. Like I've, I've got these 10 things I got to get done because I'm out of here. And when I'm out of here, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. So I can't have this conversation about whatever you're having. Right. Uh, I, I can't be dinking around or sitting a little longer on the toilet, you know, playing on social media. Like I gotta, I gotta do my business and yet get to business. Yeah. So those boundaries are very important. And then in addition to that, I would make sure that men are communicating effectively uh, and they're being men of their word. So you need to communicate with your wife what you're doing. It's not enough. You might believe that she, that she knows what you're doing or why you're doing it or what's going on. Maybe there's a project or task at work that requires a little bit more of your time. Uh, she doesn't know that. Right. How would she know that unless you communicate that? Or let's say it's going to be busy for the next two months at work. That, that's a season that happens. That's understandable. And so you need to communicate that effectively with her and say, look, hon, um, for the next two months, they've asked us to do this assignment or we're, we're building this project and uh, I'm going to be working a little bit later. Communicate that with her. And then when two months is up, let two months be up and then get back to where it was before. And, and she'll learn too from drawing upon your past experience. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if this happened two years ago and you said, "Hun, for the next two months, I'm going to be really busy. And then it ended up being 10 months or 12 months. How do you think she's going to respond when you come to her now and say, Hey, it's going to be two months. we got this busy pro She's not going to believe you. Right. She's not going to have any faith in you. So you got to be a man of your word and you got to build up her uh, trust and, and credibility and belief in you. And you do that by communicating effectively and then honoring the word and the, 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 the communication. Dude, that, that's such deep insight. The communication piece of it has been a game changer in my marriage of, for example, next week, I'm putting on this virtual event for previous guests of the show. Hope you can make it by the way. Um, but 
I told my wife, like leading up to this, I want to make sure that this is a, this is a very impactful thing for, for the attendees leading up to it. That's going to require some invested time and, and some really some heavy focus on top of, you know, work and the podcast and the other things I'm doing. So I just want to make sure we're on the same page that, you know, over this span of this couple of weeks, I'm not going to be, you know, able to sit down and, and watch our, a show or do is our, our normal things just leading up to this and having that communication. That's something that I wouldn't have done a few years ago, but having that communication was, has, has changed everything for us. Cause interesting. Oh, okay. How can I help? Or I understand, right. like, I'll let you do your thing. Whereas I would have expected in the past, like, Hey, you know, I'm working hard for our family and I'm just trying to do this to like create success for us. And, you know, dumbass yeah. me would have, would have thought she just knew that, but that's, yeah, uh, it's that old, uh, that old thing about making assumptions or assuming people know, don't, don't ever assume it makes an asset of you and me. Yep. And <laughs> yeah. that's a hundred percent true. And so many guys are like, Oh, she knows she understands. Does she? Right. How do you know? <laughs> How can you be so sure that she does? Should she? I mean, that's what another, another thing she should understand. She should get it. <laughs> hey, well, look, maybe, maybe to a degree, but if, again, if you're not communicating, with her. And, and, and here's the other thing about what you're saying. You can actually enlist her help mm -hmm. and she would be honored to help you. We run live events. We do about any, anywhere from two to four events per year. And I enlist my wife's help and she actually enjoys it because I, I, I ask her to do the things and she has ideas, but she does the things that she's really exceptional and good at. And I do the other things. Yep. And then I honor her publicly with the guys. Hey, we just got to give a shout out to my wife. She did this and this and this, and this event would not be the same. Um, and she actually loves event weekends that, that we host here at our home and, and on our property because she feels like she's part of it and she is part of it. And, and I'm honoring her by asking her to do these certain things. And she does such a wonderful job. And so you never know it. Like, here's how I look at it. You're either through your communication and through your efforts and the work that you're doing, you're, and even in your wife and your kids, you're either building them as an ally or an adversary. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you're doing your work, and, uh, and you're providing for the family and you're outside and you're at the office and you're doing this 10, 12, whatever hours a day, you, you can either communicate effectively, uphold boundaries with her and, and turn her to an ally where she says, you know what, uh, Brad's going out, Ryan's going out every day and he's providing for the family and I see what he's doing and he's communicating with us and he's grinding away for us. That's an ally. She wants to support you. Or if you don't do that, she's going to look at you as an adversarial role and say that that is a direct threat to him leading the family effectively, mm -hmm. right? So it's got to be one or the other. There's no fence sitting here. You're either building an ally or building an adversary to varying degrees. And so your words and your actions matter as, as that battle continues. Yeah. I mean, it sounds, you talked about integration earlier, and that's just another point of integration of being able to integrate your family into your professional goals. And, and once those two come together like that, and all of a sudden your wife is, like you said, your ally and she's helping make your, your, your events even better than they right. would have been without her. It's a win-win on all fronts. And what a shitty way to live. If you aren't excited about talking about your work or having your kids come to work with you or, or sharing about how your day went. And I know there's millions of men who are experiencing that, you know, you sit down over dinner, if at all, and you should do that, by the way, you sit down together over dinner and you know, your wife says, well, how was your day? And you're like, uh, uh. <laughs> it's like God, isn't that a red flag that something should change? Look, I get it. Cause I know there's a bunch of guys listening right now who are thinking, well, that's me, but I have to do that. I get it. Mm -hmm. I get, yes. There's a point in your life where, yeah, that's what you have to do, mm -hmm. but work towards something better. Right. You know, I'm, I'm turning 40 as of this recording, I'm turning 40 in two days. And to think that I'm, you know, like halfway through my life, if I live to, to, to the average age, uh, that's a, that's a crazy thing to think about. Why on earth would I spend any more time than I need to doing shit that I don't want to do? And I don't like, again, mm -hmm. I get it. Sometimes we have to, cause we're men and the duty is what calls, but we should be working towards creating a life that we're happy about, that we're excited about that when you can get to the office, you're, you're engaged with that, that you have friends outside of just your family members, that you have hobbies and activities that are important to you, that when you go home, you actually like going home. You like your wife. You like spending time with your children. If that's not your current situation, 
that should be huge red flags that you need to change something in your life and make it better because we don't have a whole lot of time. Amen. Well, and, and I guess to the counter of not having a lot of time, you know, especially for young dads thinking about for, to, for, to your point that you're, if you're at your 40th birthday, you're halfway to the average lifespan, that is still a long time of your life left. So if you're 30, 35, you have kids, you feel stuck, but you don't have, you know, a path to get out of that, or you're not actively thinking about how to develop a, you know, a a life that you feel more fulfilled in, you've got a fuckload of time left to work through and to get to that. So don't give up. I don't know, man. I think there's a danger in in that. I think there's a danger in saying that, you know, it's like, yeah, I mean, 40 years, that sounds like a lot. That's not a lot of time. I mean it more as accepting where you're at early on saying, this is, this is the path I'm on. So I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to grind and just go down this path because I see maybe a a route to financial success, even though I don't love what I'm doing, but not too late, I think is what, is what you're saying, you know, wherever you are, it's not too late. Yeah. That's a better way of putting it, but let's not, let's not fool ourselves into thinking that, you know, I've got plenty of time to make this. No, you don't, man. My oldest just turned 13. That's five years. Mm -hmm. That's true. Five years left with him. That's not a lot of time. Yeah. And so I think we ought to be thinking, yes, there's value in looking at what you want to accomplish in the next 12 months and the next three years and five years and that there's value in that. But I think we ought to look at it at a more incremental level. What, what are you doing today? Mm-hmm. that's making your life better. What, what, what moves are you making right now in this very instant that are improving your ability to lead your family more effective or to live a more fulfilling life? I mean, these are this, this sort of question is a litmus test for everything that you're doing. Should I do this podcast? Is this going to help me in my goals and endeavors? In this case, it is. That's why I'm on this. Yeah. But if it wasn't, no, I'm not going to do it because I got a thousand other things to do and I don't have a whole lot of time to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. So for you with goal setting, do you set those long-term goals and then back into the daily hourly increments? Or is it just kind of a general vision that you're, you're aligning your, your daily schedule around? Yeah. So I've got this, this planning system that I use. So this is my planner. So every day I'm in here doing my thing, but the first step of the planning system that I've developed is that I will create a vision for myself Mm. and that's orienting me. Right. So how long out is that vision typically? It isn't, it isn't like, here's my 12 month vision. It's just a vision for the kind of man that I want to be. I want to be fit and lean and strong and capable and influential. And so I've got a a in-depth statement about the kind of man that I am, but it isn't like in 12 months, I will be dot, dot, dot. That's not Mm -hmm. how you So I take this, this vision for the type of individual, the type of man that I want to be. And I start working backwards into 90 day segments. That's what I do. Got it. So I create goals in four particular sections of my life over a 90 day period. And then what I do from there is I break it down even further. And I say, what is one tactic, just one, one tactic that I need to do every single day for the next 90 days in order for me to accomplish the objective at hand. So I'll Mm -hmm. give you an example. Right now, my oldest son and I are building a canoe and we're having a lot of fun doing it. Uh, we, it's been challenging at times. We're dealing with a couple little issues right now that we got to work towards and we got to do some research and figure it out on how we're going to fix a couple little screw ups, which you're fine. We'll, we'll manage it. Uh, so my goal was, it was a 90 day goal to build a canoe. We started January 1st and every single day, unless I was, you know, traveling Mm -hmm. every single day, him and I have spent anywhere from 15 minutes to three hours a day doing this. Okay. Now we're not going to hit that in 90 days because we just hit the 90 day just yesterday as of this recording, right? We're not going to hit it, but we're closer. Yeah. And so now I'm going to evaluate. And for the second quarter, my goal is to actually finish the canoe. So <laughs> this, in this particular instance, I've had to carry over the goal. The tactic has stayed the same. Mm-hmm. And there's other situations, whether it's fitness goals or income goals or family goals that I've hit in 90 days. And then when 90 days comes up, I reset, but I orient it towards the vision that I have for myself. And occasionally that vision will even change as priorities and opportunities and obligations change for me as well. Nice. And those 90 day, is that just the, is that been a kind of trial and error that you found 90 days is what works best for you? 
Yeah, I, look, if, if it's for me personally, and I've found this to be true for thousands and thousands of men who have gone through the process that we share at this point, uh, anything longer than 90 days is just too long to stay hyper-focused and motivated on. Mm. Okay, Because things change. Right. You know, we were talking about this earlier. You, we don't know, we don't even remember what we did last weekend. Or here's another way to look at it. I don't even know what I'm going to have for dinner tonight, <laughs> let alone what I'm going to be doing in 90 days and what the political landscape and the economical climate, like, I don't, I don't know. So if I go any longer than 90 days, some of that stuff becomes irrelevant just based on things changing. Mm -hmm. Now, if I go too short, that doesn't give me, like if I do it for a week, that doesn't give me enough time to actually move the needle in any meaningful and significant way. Let's say I want to lose 30 pounds. Okay. You can do that in 90 days. I mean, it's going to be some work depending on your physical situation. It's going to be some work, right? That's possible. It's not possible in a week. And if you spread it out over a year, 30 pounds in a year, come on. Like, are you even doing anything? <laughs> You're not even pushing as hard as you nearly right. Can be pushing. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah, the 90 day amount has seemed to work really well for again, me and thousands of other guys who've gone through the process. Yeah. I love that. Um, one question I wanted to dig into a little bit, I think we touched on it a little bit, but you know, in business and in different areas of life, you get the question around, you know, failure or challenges that you have to overcome that ultimately help you to, to grow and become better at that task. Mm -hmm. Are there any specific challenges or at the t time of it happening, a perceived failure in your realm of family and fatherhood specifically that looking back actually helped you grow into a better father and, and you're grateful for that experience? I mean, there's, there's the relationship I had with my father that mm. certainly helped me grow into a, a better father. Um, I take cues and, and, and ideas from other men that I'm, that I'm surrounded by. And I think, man, that's a really good idea. I should do yeah. that where I haven't done that in the past, or I've done the ex exact opposite of that. You know, I'm not sure if there's like one particular moment where I feel like oh, I really messed that up or this really screwed things up. I do this every day, which is probably why I'm having a hard time figuring out what that one thing would be. But, <laughs> you know, I lose my patience with my kids uh, or I yell at them. Uh, or I misconstrue a situation that's happening and I get after them because I misinterpreted how it actually went down. Mm. I do this all the time. Every day I do this, you know, and I'm, I'm a guy who's actually talking about these things with men and every day I'm screwing up. So yeah. yeah, I don't know if there's one particular instance, but what I try to do each and every day is do what, what I call an after action review. Mm. And I do it with my business and I do it with my personal life. I do it I actually do it multiple times per day. When I get done with this podcast with you, Brad, I'm going to do um, uh, an after action review. I'm going to ask, okay, did I, did I articulate a message that was valuable? Did I, did I present it in the best possible way? Where could I have done better? Mm. Uh, when I go to jujitsu, I think the same thing. Last night I went to jujitsu and I wasn't feeling it. And I didn't just accept that. It's like, well, why wasn't I feeling it? Was my diet off? Was I tired? Um, I trained earlier in the day in, in the gym. So maybe that had something to do with it. So I evaluated it, but I do the same thing with my family dynamic. You know, how, how, how did the relationship with my kids go today? Mm -hmm. What did I do? Well, what did I not do so well? Uh, wh where did I thrive? Where did I fall behind? What things can I do tomorrow that will help this relationship be better? So I'm constantly doing these after action reviews uh, and it's gone a long way in pr improving how I show up consistently. And that's the key, right? right? It's not enough to show up just once and be really good at one time. Anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. You have to, con a, a, a great father has to do this day in and day out forever. Right. Yeah. Cause one big fuck up one day can ruin it all. <laughs> right. And, or, or alternatively one grand slam of fatherhood isn't going to make up for sure. all the other bullshit that you've been doing for the past 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love that too, because you're taking this idea of learning from challenges or failures and, but you're just boiling it down to the micro level, making those incremental improvements and tracking it on such a regular basis that that's all we have. Yeah. It's instead of waiting till you get way off track and trying to turn 90 degrees, you're making one degree turns and, and just right. staying on course. So that's a yeah, genius something concept. happened yesterday. I can't, or it was a couple of days ago. And um, gosh, I can't even remember what it is at this point, which is weird. 
Yeah, I can't remember, but I, I had to apologize to my kids, mm -hmm. my, my second son, in fact. I had to apologize to him and say, hey, you know, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't mean to do that. And uh, that was not your mistake or not your fault. That was my fault. And here's how I'm going to make sure that I correct that moving forward. A lot of guys won't do that because they think, well, you don't owe an apology. Well, yeah, if you messed up, yeah, you do actually owe an apology. Mm -hmm. You do actually need to make amends. I don't, I don't ever believe in apologizing to the mob or large swaths of people that you didn't actually uh, offend or hurt in any significant way. But <laughs> individuals, yeah, man, if I hurt an individual, I'm going to try to make amends. And if that's my son or my daughter, then yeah, that's, I'm going to apologize. I'm going to look them right in the eye and I'm going to say, I messed up. I am sorry. And here's what I'm going to do to ensure that that doesn't happen moving forward. I think that's a very powerful exercise as a father. Yeah. Because not I only is it good for them, to, to, to make amends, but it's also good for them to see a man who's mature enough yes. to, to admit his faults and then to fix it. Mm. Yeah. I, I think that's so outrageous that they that men think that they don't, they don't owe their kids any apologies or that they, they, they cannot be in that situation where they need to apologize to their kids or, or need to own their actions. And it may just be that blatant. I don't know if it's as blatant as I, I've thought a lot about this. If it's as blatant as like, well, I don't owe them an apology. I really, I don't think it's that. Is it a lack of ownership? I think it's an ego thing. Hmm. I mean, it could, you're, you're also right. I think it could be a lack of ownership. Like, Hey, you, well, it wasn't my fault. You know, like they're just, they're just being little dinks or they're doing this or they're doing that. And they shouldn't do that. So it was my fault. Right. So yes, I think there's lack of, of ownership, but I also think it's an ego thing. You know, like who wants to apologize? Who wants mm -hmm. to admit they're wrong? Right. Who wants to go say sorry to, to a child of, of, of all things? Like, no, <laughs> who wants to do that? Nobody wants to do that. Right. That's a sting to the ego. So yeah. I'm not sure that anybody is, I'm sure there are people, but I'm not sure there's large groups of men who are saying, well, I don't owe my, my kid an apology. Like they don't say it. They don't express it consciously like that. Right. Subconsciously something's happening where they won't do it. Yeah. I think the, uh, for me, at least my person, from my experience, the best thing you can do to, uh, to outgrow that is to marry a strong-willed woman who calls you out on your bullshit. Cause that's yeah. helped me big time in realizing, Oh wait, yeah, I am a knucklehead at times. And I was absolutely wrong. And I do owe an apology. <laughs> well that, and also honoring her feedback. Yes. Yeah. Right. So you might marry this strong-willed woman like I have, and it sounds like you have, and if I beat her down by, I'm not talking about physically beating her down, but, it, but in the context of what I'm saying, if, right. if I don't accept her feedback and I don't give her a voice and I don't allow her the opportunities to assert herself and to lead effectively with me by mm -hmm. uh, either uh, manip emotional manipulation or some sort of verbal abuse or any sort of abuse, right. uh, and I shut her down, well, that's just as bad as not having somebody that, that could actually help you. And, and sure, there's ways that, you know, you hope your wife will communicate with you. And right. there's also boundaries. I told my wife, Hey, no, you don't, I, I will not be talked to you like that. And mm -hmm. she's told me that yeah. because we both crossed the line, but we have boundaries. We communicate the boundaries. Uh, yesterday I got after her about something completely dumb, just something dumb, but I was in a bad mood and she's like, why are you being a jerk? And I'm like, I'm not being a jerk. I got defensive. Of course, like we do. And then I, and then I waited 10 minutes and I was like, oh no, yeah, you were actually being an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> and so I went to her and I said, Hey, you know what? I apologize. I was in a bad mood. I was distracted with a few other things, which doesn't make it right or justify it. That was what was going on. And I realized that I took that out on you and I'm sorry for doing that. I should not have done that. Mm -hmm. And it was fine. You know? Yeah. Now I don't make a habit of doing that, right. Of messing up that way. But when I do, you know, I try to make amends to the best that I can. Yeah. I think so. for me, oftentimes I come back to this concept of ownership because it's one of my core values, but that's a, a perfect example of implementing that in your own life of owning it when you recognize that, oh, wait a minute, looking back, I was being a jerk and going right. back and, and taking ownership of that. And then you also mentioned the word communication again. And I mean, it's just, I, I can't overemphasize communication in relationships, how, how much that's changed my own relationships. So yeah. Um, well, and I think you also need to experience the pain of messing up. You need to feel yeah. the weight of it because if there's no consequence for messing up, then mm -hmm. you won't learn the lesson. Yeah. So in this simple context of, of getting after my wife more than I definitely should have, 
if I didn't go and humble myself, cause I didn't want to apologize initially and I don't want to be in that position, you know? So if I don't humble myself enough to experience the sting of what I did and how I commu communicated with her, then there's nothing that will change my behavior. Now, on the other hand, I, I went to her and I apologized and I had to humble myself and I had to say, I'm sorry. That's, those are the consequences of my behavior. So next time I'm less likely to do that because I know I don't want to experience right. that again. Sucks. <laughs> yes, it sucks. It should suck. This is actually one of the things that I have a problem with uh, in, in society as a whole, when we try to save our children or save people from the sting of defeat and, and, and challenging situations. It's like, no, that you should feel bad about losing. You lost the game and you feel bad about it. Good. That's the point. You, yeah. Like you shouldn't feel happy about that. You shouldn't feel pride because you showed up. You should feel bad that you didn't perform to the best of your ability and feeling that way and experiencing the weight of that will drive you to be better. Now right. we as fathers have an, a responsibility to work our kids through a healthy response to that. Mm -hmm. Like my kids feel bad about something. Uh, maybe they were picking on their, their sibling or they didn't get their chores around the house done and they feel bad about it or guilty. I say, good, you actually should feel like that, but I don't leave the conversation there. Right. Right. We start working through, well, what can you do? How can you fix it? How can you feel better? What do you think the guilt or the sadness or the sorrow or the, whatever you're experiencing is teaching you? And what is it telling you, you should be doing now moving forward. And so as fathers, we work our children through this because if they don't, they'll come to some very unhealthy, unproductive uh, conclusions to the way that they feel and they'll try to mask it. Mm. Right. So the, they'll feel bad. And they're like, well, I don't want to feel bad anymore. So I'm just going to subdue that and hide that. And, and it's actually not a healthy way to pursue life. And that's why we have a bunch of millions of entitled young people who are uh, incapable of handling any sort of uh, perceived slight against them, any sort of, you know, words that, that might offend them. That's why we even have terms like microaggressions. Like, like who, whoever is complaining about a, a microaggression is somebody whose parents didn't teach them to have a healthy relationship with critique and mm -hmm. failure and losing and people not liking you. Right. That was a fault. It was a failure of the parents. Right. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it, if uh, you should understand what it feels like to lose a game, but as the dad, you don't just say, yeah, you sucked and walk away. You say, yeah, that sucked. That, that feeling sucks. Look at these, let's look at what we can improve here to right. have a different result next time because right. we're always growing and, and improving. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my son, my 13 year old, he's been on this, this incredible fitness journey and it started as a fitness journey, but it was so, it's so much more than that now uh, about six to eight months ago. And the kid is unrecognizable. Hmm. I mean, he's lost a bunch of weight. He's, he just maxed out on his push press this morning. He's, he's training jujitsu three to four times a week. It's just an absolutely incredible journey that he's going through. And it started because he was embarrassed about his weight. And, you know, I could have went to him when he asked about it and said, no, 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 you're fine. Everything's good. Oh, just love yourself the way that you are like mm -hmm. body positive movement, all this kind of bullshit. And, and he was talking to me about it and he was upset about it. And I said, well, do you think you're overweight? And, and he said, yeah, I think I am. What do you think? And I said, I, I think you are too. Mm. <laughs> because that's the truth. Yeah. Like, why would I, why would I hide that from him? And I said, I think you are too, but you know what? We can do something about it. That's yeah. the cool thing. So we can fix it. We can get on the path and we can lock in our diet. We can, we can exercise and we don't have to take it to the extreme. And at times he's done and I've had to rein him back in, but we, we can do it right and we can do it in a healthy way and we can make it fun and exciting. And to see his transformation over the past six to eight months is a testament to being truthful with your kids mm -hmm. instead of lying to them and, 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 and telling them that it's okay to accept mediocrity or, or a, a lesser version of yourself. I'm not mm -hmm. interested in that for me. And I'm certainly not interested in that for my kids, but that's hard to do that. You have to actually look at your kid and say, yeah, you know, you are a little overweight or yeah, you could have done better and you didn't, but let me help you. Right. 
And it all, that makes the whole difference is what comes after that. Of course. Cause when you leave it at that, then you're an asshole. But when you right. help from, from that point on, you redirect the conversation and the energy into what can we change? How can I help you in this, in this journey? What are the options? Then all of right. a sudden you open up right. a world of possibilities to them and empower them to, to, to change their own lives. Ryan, one question I like to ask each guest is if you could, you could look at from whichever way is easier for you to think through. If you could go in a time machine and give advice to yourself right when your first son was being born, or if you're talking to a new dad who just had their first kid and you're giving them some advice, is there one thing that you've learned over this journey of fatherhood over the last 13 years that you would impart on that younger version of yourself or that new dad? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you're always going to hear the advice of like communicate with your wife and spend time with them. You're going to hear that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of practical advice. That's good. You should, you should listen to that. Yeah. (laughs) But the thing you won't hear a lot, especially as a new father is don't ditch your friends and your hobbies. Mm. Don't do it. I know it's tempting. I know you want to be there for your wife. I know you want to be there with your kid. I know all that. I get all that. And I actually commend you for that. That's honorable. You should be doing those things but don't ditch your friends and don't ditch your hobbies. Continue mm-hmm. to have a schedule within reason, communicate with your wife and let her know how this is going to play out. But you shouldn't be gone all night, every night, every day. Right. But maybe there's a night a week where you go hang out with the guys mm-hmm. or at, you know, every month, 20 of you guys get together and you watch UFC, you have fight night and that's what you do. Or every Tuesday and Thursday morning, uh, you train jujitsu or you go golfing or again, whatever your thing is, don't ditch your friends and your hobbies, right? Continue to maintain those within reason, honor the commitment that you made to your wife. And of course your child, by bringing a child into this world, you did actually make a commitment, uh, whether you acknowledge it or not, you did make a commitment. Uh, so honor that. Yes but don't ditch your hobbies and your friends, maintain those things, do it within reason. And I promise you, your wife's going to be better off. You're going to be better off. Your kids are going to be better off because you're going to have the energy needed to be able to lead both your wife and your child or children effectively. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that just a little bit more of like that energy? (laughs) Why, why that's so important? Why that's an energizing effect that is actually going to help you be a better dad, better husband, better in all the things that you do. Yeah. So one of the primary responsibilities of men is to provide. So when I talk about our role and responsibility as men, I talk about protect, provide, preside, preside synonymous with leadership. Mm. Okay. So protect, provide, preside. So what a lot of guys will do, and I know this to be true that, because I've seen it with, with so many different men that I've talked with, and I saw it in my own life as well, is that I would be so engaged with work and so engaged with trying to take care of her and my children that there wasn't any sort of uh, energy that I was personally bringing to the equate, excuse me, the equation. So what I was asking my wife to do is not only provide her own energy, but also provide me the energy that I was not at the time getting for myself. Mm. And then she burned out because I wore her down. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and here's how, you know, if this is happening, if a woman says uh, I'm not in love with you anymore, if she says, you know, I, I feel like I'm living with a roommate, uh, the, the, the spark isn't there like it once was. I mean, take the term spark, right? And I think of a spark plug, mm-hmm. energy, right? right? Fuel, oxygen, heat to create a spark. If you aren't bringing part of that to the, to the equation, to the table, then it's going to burn out. You need all of that. Mm -hmm. So where do you get it from? You get it outside of her Mm -hmm. so or your children. You get like my kids don't complete me. My wife doesn't complete me. They're a part of my life. They're an integral part of my life, but it's not the entire thing of my life. And my, my world does not center around her or my children. It's a very integral part of it, but I have to go out and procure the energy for myself so that I can actually offer something to the relationship. And by the way, she does too, yeah. which is why here's what I used to do. I used to, I used to I'm trying to think about the right way to say it. I would give my wife such a hard time 
about wanting to go spend time occasionally with her girlfriends or her mom or her sisters that she felt guilty for doing it. And I would play into that because I didn't want her to go do that. I was being selfish. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't allow her the opportunities to go out and create her own spark to bring it back into the equation. But when I learned how to do this, not only for myself, but to honor her desire to do that, she came back into the relationship as a new woman every time she went out with her girls or every time she went out with her mother. She came back into the relationship more energized, more rejuvenated, more lovely, more beautiful, and bringing something meaningful and valuable to the equation. Yeah. So we have to go out and get the energy. She has to go out and get her energy. Then collectively, you come together. If you're getting it from each other yeah. in too large quantities, you're going to burn the other partner out. That makes a lot of sense. I've also found that uh, if you have, if you can get yourself enough energy to actually encourage your spouse to do that too, that's something that I've seen in, in my relationship is sometimes, you know, my wife is, just, she's very selfless and loves being a mom, you know, loves being there to take care of the family. But sometimes I push back, Hey, you haven't done anything for yourself. Why don't you go out and get a massage? Why don't we book that? Mm. I've got Stella for the, for the Saturday morning or whatever it is by doing that. And just, you know, giving her that space and, and proactively pushing that, it, it, it helps like both of us, she comes back with more energy Then, of course, she's more willing to give me that time to go do my shit. So I don't know. That's yeah. just something I've found in my relationship has been helpful too. For, well, that's uh, part of what that. defines us as men. Mm -hmm. So, so think about it. I mean, there's a lot, we don't have to get into all of this, but, but I want you to think about it from this context. Part of our, what defines us as men is being able to offer enough provision that goes above and beyond ourselves. So if you think about uh, boys, so I've got three boys. They're not men. They're boys. They're kids. Like mm -hmm. I, Nobody even expects them to be men. Right. We expect them to be learning how to. Mm -hmm. But what do children do? Well, frankly, if you strip everything else away, they consume more than they produce. That's what they do. Yeah. They consume energy. They consume food. They consume time and resource. That's what they do right? Now there's other things they add, of course, they add a, a, mean, a, a level of fulfillment and love and joy and challenge in a positive way. Yes. But after everything's said and done, they consume more than they produce. And sure. that's what a child does. And yep. that's what we expect of a child. Then we have a young man or a young woman who graduates high school, let's say, and uh, is, is now in college, or maybe they're in an internship or they're starting their career. And that individual is now able, or at least working towards taking care of themselves, not other people, but themselves. Mm -hmm. They're paying their mortgage. They bought their own car. They're paying back their loans. They're the ones doing their own grocery shopping and cooking and taking care of their house. And they're taking care of themselves. And that's what we want. We want our children to get to the point where they can take care of themselves, but they're still young adults. Okay. They, they are incapable of taking care of other people, right? They're not there yet. And then you start to move into manhood, which is not only can I take care of myself, but I've gotten so proficient at taking care of myself that now I can begin to take care of others. Mm. I've developed a skill set. I'm making more money. I'm more mature emotionally mm -hmm. and physically and mentally. I'm more efficient with the way that I show up. I'm more responsible with the resources that I have. And now because I can take care of myself, I can take care of a spouse. I can take care of bringing a child into this world. I can take care of my neighbor. Maybe my neighbor is hung up because they have a medical illness or an injury and I can go over and I can mow their lawn. Right. Well, a man can do that because he knows how to manage his time effectively and he has enough resources to be able to go do that. Mm-hmm. This is the transition from boy to man. Boy, can't take care of myself. Need everybody to do everything for me. Young man, young woman, I can take care of myself now. Mature woman, mature man, I can take care of not only myself, but I have the capacity to take care of others. Interesting. I've never see, heard it put that way, but I love that. It makes so much sense. That's awesome. Ryan, I think I've gone over on our time limit here, and I want to be no respectful worries, of your time. Yeah, dude. Yeah, so, I, I mean, you were, you dropped so much knowledge here and I'm sure that uh, some of the dads listening are want to check out you, what you've got going on. And I can say just from, from what I've absorbed of your content that you put out a ton of awesome stuff, great conversations with other guys on your podcast, but also a lot of good content that, that you're pushing a lot of good resources. Where can, where can guys find what you're doing and, and some of the stuff that you have out there? 
Yeah. I mean, the best place is the order of man podcast. So wherever you're listening to this, just type in order of man and you'll find our podcast as well. And I think coupled between Brad, your, your show and our show, you'll, you'll get so much tremendous advice that'll help you on your path to becoming a better man and a better father. Um, and then outside of that, I talked about this battle planner. We actually just came out with the digital version of this battle planner. Nice. So if you type in order of man battle planner, either in, uh, the Google play store or, um, the, the app store on Apple, uh, you'll find the order man battle planner app and there's a free version that walks you through everything. And then there's upgraded versions and things like that. But if you're interested in that system that I talked about, you could either do it this way, which is fine, or you can do it on the app, which is pretty cool. And that just came out last week. So that's awesome. Congrats. I'll definitely be checking that thanks, out. Man. We'll have that yeah, all dude. linked up. So Ryan, thanks brother. I appreciate you carving out some time. Great, great conversation. And I'm super yeah, pumped. Yeah. We got to do this. Yeah, me too, man. Thanks for the great conversation. Appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk with you guys.